everybody. This is uh, Benjamin Davis here uh, as your host today for the Rule of Law and the New Abnormal, the session for today. And the um, title of our program today is uh, Unprecedented, A Choice and Change in an Amazing Week. We've had uh, a number of things going on. Uh, Donald Trump's uh, acceptance speech at the uh, RNC, then we had uh, President uh, Biden's uh, saying that he is stepping down from running and his endorsement and others' endorsement of Kamala Harris. That's how you say it, Kamala Harris, in case you didn't know, uh, to uh, to be the uh, uh, presidential uh, nominee, a uh, presumptive pre presidential nominee for the uh, Democratic uh, Party. Wonderful panelists here today. Our, our, old, our friend, our elder, Vernelia Randall, uh, Emerita Professor of Law, University of Dayton School of Law, old friend, and Daniel Rainey, another old friend who's the founder of the firm of Holistic Solutions Incorporated, and he's a board member of the International Council for Online Dispute Resolution. So welcome, Vernelia. Welcome, Daniel. How you doing? I hope all's well. Fine, so, thank you. Oh, good. So let us start out. Uh, I heard uh, yesterday, I think, it, uh, or so. This I'm starting out with uh, uh, former President Trump, now uh, Republican nominee Trump's um, speech. That the uh, written speech was three thousand words. Okay, the one that was handed out to the press. But his 92-minute presentation that he did on Thursday last week ended up being twelve thousand words. So uh, do you have any uh, sense of what the impact of that speech was on you or, or anything you read about it? It had no impact on me because I didn't listen. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, it was, I, I have been aware for a long time that, that one of the characteristics, and there are many, that Trump has criminal, felon, convicted Trump as to dictators is they, they are not, they are unaware of time. They think that they talk for hours uh, saying nothing uh, because they, they can come command the audience to stay there. And my feeling about how long the speech was is that's in line with his attitude of people don't have nothing to do but listen to me. Daniel, you have any thoughts? Well, I'm, I'm in sort of the same position myself in, in that it's very difficult for me to listen to Trump because it makes my blood pressure go up. Uh, and so I'll be very upfront about that. What I find interesting um, in his comments is that um, for a long time now, he's gotten the pass from what he has referred to as the mainstream media. He derides them for being biased, et cetera, but they've given him a real pass uh, because he says things that are outrageous. He says things that are flatly lies, uh, not just distortions, but flat out lies. And essentially it's like, well, okay, just another day with Trump. Um, this time, for example, there was a fact check on the, uh, the speech that he gave at the convention but it was buried back in the interior pages of the Washington Post. It was an interesting read, but something I already knew. Um, but it's basically he's gotten the pass on, on this outrageous behavior because the, quote, mainstream media has been focusing on whether Joe Biden was too old to run. Um, and so he's sort of flown under the radar. And I'm wondering whether or not that's going to change a bit. He has said, as I understand, that he's willing to debate Kamala Harris numerous times. Well, this is one of those uh, be careful what you ask for kind of moments, because uh, she's very sharp and she ain't afraid to go out and, and pull out the gloves. Um, and so it, it may be that he's, his days of getting completely by with all of this bullshit uh, is, pardon my language, uh, is over. It's, it's an interesting situation that we're in because we, this could be a pivot moment in the campaign in terms of the way things are presented. We'll see if it is or not. Do I think that it will change the minds of any of the people who are going to vote for him? I don't think so. I think most of the people who are going to vote for Trump are solid. Uh, they're, uh, for whatever reason they have, they're not going to abandon him. So the question is whether or not independents and people who wouldn't come out to vote before now are going to be energized enough to come out. I think that 
I mean, I was one of those people who only because I live in a state where that is completely controlled by MAGA that I would that I had come to the decision that against all my instincts, I would probably vote for Biden. Uh, because I personally have never believed in voting for the lesser of two evils. Uh, my mind has always been evil is evil. Uh, and, and whether I, picking the switch I'm going to be beat with, which is what my foster mother used to make us do, <laughs> never, with, never was my cup of tea. You know what? You pick it. I don't care. Because I'm going to be beat either way. But having lived in Florida, I've come to realize that in the context of the, the MAGA conservatives, and I put them in a different group, they're a really different bunch. And they're willing to do stuff to cause pain and injury just for the sake of causing pain and injury. For instance, this government in Florida has passed a law making it illegal for cities and corporations to tell companies to give water to workers who work in the sun. And not only that, to make it illegal to for them to tell companies to educate people about working in the sun. And do you think that's because they passed a bill that would cover all that? No. So they're willing to say, we're willing to cause people to suffer and die just so that we can punish people, Democratic, because most of the cities in Florida, not most, but many of the cities in Florida are Democratic strongholds. And so they're saying, like, we're willing to punish people. We're willing to allow people to be punished to die. That's a different sort of, I, I, I don't even think that's evil anymore. That's the devil in coordinated. Mm. Ah. It's not well. evil against evil. It's evil against the devil. And well. I guess I have to turn out and vote against the devil. And uh, that's, uh, and it's not Trump. It's it's the Heritage Foundation. It's Project uh, 2025. It's uh, whatever he's calling his platform, 27 or 47. It's all that stuff. If it was just Trump being Trump, lying, convicted Trump, okay. But it's they are uh, they're slobbering at the mouth to take hold and spend the next four years uh, tearing down what little safeguards, and they are really little that we have in our in our society. And so uh, that's a different sort of devil, I think. I'm I'm hearing from both of you that uh, 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 Trump's speech was not a unity speech or a unifying moment, or maybe it was a unifying the MAGA folks, uh, <laughs> but not unifying. And from your experience down there in Florida, certainly not a unifying experience under the MAGA folks down there. So let's move forward a little. You know, that was like Thursday night. And so we're sitting here on Friday, we're relaxing, Saturday, we're relaxing, and then Sunday, um, my, my wife, who's not particularly uh, political, came up and said, Joe Biden has stepped away from the race. And I said, oh, so I started to check that out. So I started to think about a name for that, and we, we'd gone from the old man versus the con man to something else now, maybe. So and because he, he endorsed Kamala Harris too, so then it was like, oh, the prosecutor versus the felon. Okay, all right. Is that a way of what? Did, what, what did you think about that uh, process of and then the decision of jo of Joe Biden to 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 step away from the race? What did, what struck you about that? I was relieved because I have thought that he has been in cognitive decline. You know, the, the, we the people because he was in the election and people wanted to support him. 
the, we were not talking. And I was of the personal opinion that if he, and I think I was telling people this months ago, every he, the best you see of Joe Biden is the best he's going to be. He's only going to get worse. He is not in a situation where he's going to get better. He's going to get worse. And so if he doesn't drop out now, early, and it should have been three, four months ago, hell, he should have never run. If he, if, if he, if he waited till October, it'd be too late. He would be, he, he was, I don't think he was capable of doing the campaigning that was going to be necessary. I think that, the, that they have to pad him with so many bumper things on like I take my take my kids to the bowling alley and 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 they think because they're bowling down the middle and hitting up against those padding rails that they're bowlers but no there's all kind of protections that keeps them from going in the gutter I thought that was Biden's state so I was absolutely relieved uh when he thinks, is it? Does this mean that I think Kamala has a? She's got a fight on her hand, and up, and I don't think an uphill. I think it's an even battle, and it may be even. But I think that she might be. I don't like her, and would never vote for her except for this particular situation. But I think that uh, the the felon versus the prosecutor is a fair comparison that that the uh that many uh independents who was reluctant to vote for Biden but wasn't going to vote for Trump and reluctant to vote for Biden yeah, well they would get pulled back in how about you Daniel what did you how did you you know where were you you know that sort of moment like we've had all of our lives at different moments when these things have happened where were you when you heard this that kind of moment did you have that kind of moment when you heard about that well yeah i did actually i I'd had a conversation with some friends of mine who were very much into the political scene um and a couple of days before biden withdrew and what we were talking about at the time was that Biden was almost doing a disservice to the to the country by staying in the race, uh, and I have to say that I I'm not one of those people who who uh, has a very negative opinion of Biden. Uh, overall, I I thought given what he was handed, et cetera, et cetera, he did a, a, a really good job as president, or at least a fairly good job as president, and I would vote for him. But then again, I would vote for my cat if the Democrats ran. <laughs> against Trump. So so saying that I would have voted for him is not a, a great mark of endorsement. It's simply that's that would be my preference. What I find interesting that I'm going to be looking at as we go forward with this with Kamala is um, there's an old saying in politics that the, your biggest asset when you run for office is your record. And your biggest problem when you run for office is your record. Uh, and so she is inheriting at least in the rhetoric of the campaign, she is inheriting the things that have been said about Biden's record by Trump and the MAGA folks. So she's going to have to contend with that. What I'm interested in is whether or not she can turn that narrative a little bit to what her positions are, what she might be willing to do. Is any candidate perfect? Absolutely not. But I'll go back to what was said a little bit earlier, and that is, if, if your choice is the devil and somebody who ain't that bad, that's not really a choice. I was I was glad to see him step aside, um, and I guess there, there's a part of me also, because I mean let's face it, we're all old farts here. There's a part of me that that is has some sympathy for him as well, um, yeah. really really not wanting to give it up, and I understand that I, I totally understand that, but I think eventually he came around to do the right thing. I felt sorry for him because part of the problem was is and I think. I, I think he still has it enough to do the presidency and all that stuff. But he, the people who he trusts the most, like his wife, I think, was doing a disservice initially by encouraging him to stay on. And that may be due to the history of them being forced out and, and being told not to run and being told and her having to see him you know, take that. So she, 
you know, not wanting to do that. And as an old fart myself and someone who's dealing with my own cognitive decline, uh, I think anyone who is over 70 who doesn't think they don't have cognitive decline is lying to themselves. The amount of it is, is varies from person to person, but you know, there, there may be a one in a million person who at 76 is functioning like they were 60 in their brain, but most of us uh, have something. So I felt for him in that way. Uh, but that feeling for him couldn't get in the way of saying that he needed to step down and, and move out the way. I think it's a whole different race. I think... I think I saw the ad that she put out and I thought it, did you see her, the, the first ad she put out? No, I haven't seen it, no. It's very good, I'm impressed. I'm impressed by several things she's done. I, I, I like the ad, it, it talked about freedom. And when it talked about freedom, when it started that tone of freedom, I'm like, oh God, mm -hmm. an abstract idea of freedom. But she tied it to real life issues, freedom to read books you want to read, freedom to control your own body, freedom to marry who you wanted to, who you want to marry. So she took a concept that is very Republican and tied it into very democratic values in terms of, and I think that could appeal. I think the other things in I think this is really smart on her part. She's really leaning into her HBCU frater uh, sorority. Now, and that's real smart because as a sorority Delta person, every Delta person, every sorority has a fraternity that it's tied to. And if the, the thing that sororities and fraternities, Black sororities and fraternities know how to do is organize. Mm. Get people out. Get out there. And so in her first few days, <clears throat> excuse me, she, 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 uh, I think she's, she is tying in to Black sororities as a mean, not just to get out black vote, but just organize, campaign, door knock, footwork, be a foot soldier for her. And you know we will. <laughs> we'll be driving communities into the white suburbs and piling out the car and saying, hey, we just want to hand you a pamphlet. Don't call the police. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, in, in terms of the the, the ground game uh, that you're talking about, uh, one of the things that I, I heard along the way was that you know the the Democrats are investing in a ground game while the Republicans are kind of doing a they think they can reach their people in a different way. And the analogy I heard was that the Republicans want to thought they're going to run up the score, and then the ground game is like having the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the, the the extra the extra point of the three point team you know like that that you know that just helps you get over the top a little bit something like that if 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 you need to this actually made me think of another thing which was uh, I completely forgot to mention J D Vance yeah the, the you know the the, the vice presidential uh, nominee uh, with regards to uh, the Republicans so how's J D Vance been doing over the last few days in your view. Have you been watching a little bit of him? I personally haven't haven't seen anything that he's done, and I and I frankly don't think it really made a hell of a lot of difference which uh, who he chose. Um, I mean, I, if you if you look at the support that Trump has got, it is relatively stable. It doesn't really go up and down a lot. The real key to and and let's face it, he has never yet won the popular vote in an election. He's won, he's won the Electoral College vote, but he's never won the popular vote. And uh, he's he's had some very good campaign people back in the campaign that he won. But toward the end of that campaign, I don't know if you remember this or not, but his campaign strategists took all of their money and put it into three states. 
at the last minute. And they just abandoned everywhere else and went really hard on three states. The, the rationale that came out after the election was that they calculated if they could change 800,000, or I'm sorry, 80,000 votes over three states, they could win the Electoral College. And they did that. They lost the popular election by about a point and a half, and they won the Electoral College. I don't think his core support in terms of numbers has changed very much at all. I don't think it will change very much at all. They're committed. They're there. They're going to be there. The question that Harris has got is, can she bring those people out who are willing to vote for something other than Donald Trump? And can get, she get them to the polls? And can she do it in those states that are going to matter in the Electoral College? It's, it's going to be an interesting run. Um, she's a good campaigner. She's very smart, very good in front of the camera. Uh, she, her message is good. Um, the question is going to be on the ground game. Can she, you know, can she run out the clock, so to speak, as opposed to having a, a, a passing game because she run out the clock and, and get there? Um, it's 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 going to be interesting to see. I, I saw uh, the results of the uh, new polling today, and she's pulled within overall pulled within a point of Trump within the latest poll, which probably doesn't tell you a hell of a lot. But what does tell you something is if you look at those poll numbers, at the at the groups that are underneath the general numbers, the ones where the Democrats have been having trouble over the last few months, those numbers are up significantly, and so. Wow. The campaign is already changing, and the question is going to be, does she have enough momentum to keep that change going so that she comes out of this uh, at the end? It's it's an interesting campaign now. Before, it wasn't going to be a very interesting campaign. Now it's going to be a pretty interesting campaign. I think the J.D. Vance thing is really interesting because I think Trump picked the worst possible candidate as vice president in a, in an election against Kamala. I think he uh, that J.D. Vance from he's uh, he doesn't really add anything to the ticket in in a traditional sense in terms of getting someone who helps you in some states. Uh, it, it, he's from Ohio. Trump already had Ohio, so he didn't actually get someone that was going to help him. He doesn't bring any kind of diversity. Uh, he doesn't bring he doesn't bring race or gender or religion, uh, except he gets the, the racist nature of Republicans have been tacking his wife, who is Indian. Uh, so he doesn't bring that. But beyond that, I think that Trump was so secure in his idea that he was going to be able to beat Biden, that he didn't pay attention to how awful J.D. Vance is. Because J.D. Vance has some weird, weird ideas. And if you think about Trump being an old man who's going to die in office, you have to think about J.D. Vance as president. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know. and Lady Vance uh, thinks that single cat women, single women with no children who have cats, shouldn't have anything to say about politics. J.D. Vance thinks that uh, we shouldn't, that there should be, there shouldn't be no fault divorces. J.D. Vance thinks that abortion should be illegal at any stage, uh, even for rape and uh, whatever the thing. Mm -hmm. So he's got, he, he has got some things that the Democrats can exploit against Trump that will work against independence and people in the middle who like, oh Lord, I can't vote. I I would I'm not for Kamala, but I sure as hell don't want to vote for someone where JD Vance could end up. Not only that, I saw <laughs> he's a particularly un he doesn't have the ability to campaign and he laughs at his own jokes with you even when other people aren't laughing at it. So that makes him weird in my book. So 
<laughs> I, I don't, Trump didn't, I don't know that Trump really, I heard, I read, I didn't hear here anyway, I read, and you never know how true any of the shit you read is anymore. But I read that Peter Thiel and Elon Musk was responsible for pushing J.D. Vance uh, as uh, the candidate to pick. They're changing. They're trying to change. That was out at the beginning of the cycle when he was first put. Now they're starting to say, oh, no, it was his two sons. But I don't think his two sons have enough knowledge. To, why, you know, uh, Anyway, I think he's hard. I think he that he JD France brings something to the table that the Democrats can exploit if they will. Yeah, I was going to say a couple of things that I'd seen along the way. One was the governor of Kentucky, uh, Bashir, uh, went right at his uh, Appalachian uh, bona fides. Okay. Um, <laughs> It was, uh, you know, he was, uh, you know, he said he's not a real Appalachian. He maybe came in the summertime, you know, visit the family and all that stuff. But, he, you know, he, he's not a real Appalachian. And then uh, the other thing, of course, I've heard that people were saying was that, you know, he, in fact, that they run into these kind of people all the time is that they got so much ambition, they will say anything, right? They'll say anything. And I saw this one today was that instead of calling him a hillbilly, they called him a shillbilly, okay? Which I thought was pretty, you know, getting that phrase that's there. So, uh, you'll see, you know, we'll see what he does. But one thing that he didn't mention, and I'll just come in with that, is that there are cat men in out here. I have four <laughs> cats, okay? They're cat men, what about us? You know what I mean? I mean, I was like... You okay. don't fit because you got children. He's talking to you, but he was talking about childless people with cats. So that's me. That that's, that's, that's me. That's me. Three. That three puts cats, you in that three, cat. three cats and no kids. Yeah, you know, I mean, so, I, mean I was like, <laughs> hey, man, you don't, you know, you don't want to go there with cat people. You know, you don't want to go there with cat people because, you know, they, you know, we, we get trained by these cats, you know, and the cats are about as cold as it gets, okay, out there. <laughs> Is that like that dog loving you? <laughs> still slash you in a second. Give me a smash those cans, brother. Okay. So now that takes us through, let's see, what is today? Thursday. I think I got to Tuesday at this point of this week. You know, I mean, how are you dealing with the kaleidoscope or the, I don't know what to call, describe, the just the pace of this thing. And I'm just thinking 100 days or 104 days to go to the election. I mean, that looks like a, both a sprint and a marathon at the same time. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, as you look forward to what's going to go ahead, you know, do you have any thoughts about how you imagine these next periods going to be? Well, I'll tell you what I hope doesn't happen is I hope the Democrats don't. Well, uh, let me back up. My favorite political quote of all time comes from Mo Udall, whom you might remember from years ago. Oh, yeah. And Mo Udall was asked to describe the Democratic Party. And he said, all you have to do is envision a firing squad in a circle. <laughs> so, so, so that's where that, that quote comes from. So what I hope they don't do is that they, I hope they don't circle the wagons and start shooting at one another. I hope they go through the uh, convention with a, a degree of comedy. Uh, I mean, Harris seems to me has all the support she needs to be the, the nominee. Uh, a, little, a little good forethought about who the, the uh, vice presidential nominee is going to be and a show of unity at the convention would go a long way toward helping the campaign. And I certainly hope that's what happens. Me too. I mean, I, the Democrats, you know, being centrist, barely left organization managed to shoot itself in the foot. I think that there are a lot of progressives like myself, radicals like myself, who may be willing to back down a bit, but not a lot. They got to come up with a platform that people can support. And it's, and I think if it's centered around, no one expects, at least I, I shouldn't say no one, I don't expect Kamala to depart from Biden's policies. You know, she, yeah. 
she's not going to make a platform that's radically different from Biden, although there's definitely stuff I would want her to do if she was an independent. But she's not an independent. She's uh, a Democrat who was uh, vice president for president. So uh, she, she's going to she's going to support all his major policies. Um, and I hope no one I hope that those of us on the outside don't expect anything more. Right. Yeah, I, I, I think Democrats. I'm not so I I'm not so worried about Democrats getting into a certain thing. I'm worrying about people like me getting circling around Democrats, wanting them to do more than they can do. Well, no, that's not true. Wanting them to do what they should do, but they won't do because of this whole Trump thing. So I hope that we will give Kamala grace. I hope people who are like me will give her the grace as long as she don't do no shitty shit. I mean, I can't say that I will support anything she does because that would be a lie. She could do some things that I would say, fuck that. Uh, you know, let, but if she just support she goes forth with Biden's sort of approach to thing, it'll burn my stomach like acid. But I'll take some time. Anyway, I'm stopping at this point. We have not okay. solved all the world's problems. We've hopefully made a lot of people out there think about different this is a full contact space that we try to have here and this trying to do the rule of law and the new abnormal. And I want to thank my two guests, Elder Vernelia Randall and Daniel Rainey, for taking some time out to solve all the problems. Aloha from Charlottesville, Virginia, from Alexandria, Virginia, and from Orlando, Florida, right? And mahalo. And